Greetings, everybody. Bob Lusk, the Pond Boss, coming at you from the world headquarters of Pond Boss Magazine in Gordonville, Texas, hanging out with a very special guest tonight, my wife, <laughs> Debbie. Glad you're here, honey. Thanks. I can't wait. Yeah, we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. We're going to talk about all kinds of uh, fun stuff. You know, right now the spawn is going on. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the different habitat types that you have in your pond. And, and Debbie's going to come at you tonight with some of her thoughts. So if uh, all you guys, there's Jason Nipstead. Hey, Jason, greetings. Glad you're on board, buddy. And uh, if your wife is around, she's going to want to hear what Debbie has to say because she, Debbie sees things that guys don't see. She sees things that... Uh, to make a pond more beautiful, to make it more functional, <laughs> to make it, um, uh, to dress it up a little bit. I mean, we've done some pretty cool stuff out there. I can handle the fish. You know, one of my favorite stories is when we <laughs> when we moved into our home out there, we uh, we built a pond. And I was talking to Debbie as we were building it. Mike Otto was doing the dozer work. And as we were rocking and rolling with it, uh, there was a bunch of post oak trees. It was in an old wash right beside our house. Oh. Stephen Neely, good evening, sir. Uh, but as we were looking, I said, there was a bunch of trees, a bunch of post oak trees that needed to come out. So I said, hey, honey, come here. I want to show you this. Let's go look at this. And, and I said, I want to put these trees over here by this shore. We're going to have some fish habitat right there. It's going to be really fun. And she said, no, this is going to be a swimming pond. And I said, no, well, no, no, babe. See, you don't, I, I'm a fish guy. She said, maybe you don't understand what I just said. <laughs> I said, whoa. So now next to the house, we have a swimming pond. Now, how those fish got in there beats me. We just kept telling Ashley there weren't any. <laughs> <laughs> and we do swim in it. Yep. Tyler Stubbs is on board. Hey, Tyler, good to see you, buddy. So uh, I'm going to take a minute, see if I can get it on my laptop, because it's easier to see your questions on my laptop as we're videoing here. So bear with me one minute as I find it. Because sometimes I gotta refresh the page and Sorry. see it to come up. I know it's there. Let's see here. I don't like dead air, and you don't either. So while I'm waiting for it to come up on my laptop, because there's always a take. There, there it is, right there, babe. All right, I'm gonna blow it up. Now we can see it. Now I can read all the questions. Amber Young. Hello, Amber. Good. Gosh, I had not seen you in a long time. Jacob West, all the way from, uh, yeah, Bob, you are a lucky man. <laughs> How lucky am I? Look at this. Look at this. Jacob West, Dick Tabbert. Hello, all. Stephen Neely, I guess you know Dave Sefton. Absolutely, I know Dave Sefton, man. You see this? You see this pawn boss back here? Dave had that commissioned by a local chainsaw artist right there in Brownstown, Illinois. So you bet. And there's Gary Stevens checking in from San Antonio area. There's Richard. Let's see. Anthony Abate. Let's see who else is on right quick. Holy cow. This is going to be pretty fast and furious. We've got 20 people on board. Now, sometimes I can't see everybody that's on here. So uh, if I don't acknowledge you, forgive me because I'm just not seeing who all's on here. Bear Brundurett is on. Hey, Bear, go get your bride. She's going to want to hear what Debbie has to say. Renee's got to be around there somewhere. Grab her. In the meantime, I'm going to do my little commercial like I do every week. Pond Boss Magazine. $35 a year. Six issues. Chock full of great information. I mean, this, this issue is just loaded. In the, actually, the March-April is at the printer. It's ready to be mailed. It uh, hasn't gone out yet, but it will be momentarily. Also, just to know, Pond Boss has got a lot of resources for you. If you want to learn anything about how to build a pond, how to manage a pond, any of that stuff, we have that. You've got the pondboss.com website forum. Uh, the website itself has got all kinds of free articles, some videos and things. We archive these videos on Facebook, on our Facebook page, and we also um, archive them on YouTube. So they're accessible. Jerry Oler, Daniel Powell, Daniel from North Carolina, Jerry's from San Antonio, Brian Lawrence, Timothy Phillips, Todd Austin, Trav Housen. Good day. Holy cow. Where are you from, Travis? Good to see you, buddy. Or Trav. Pam Thunderbird. Hey. hey, Roy Worthy. Howdy, Roy. Glad you guys are on board. We also have a number of books. If you guys need a book, just add water. This is 
This is a pretty cool book. Mike Cocktail, my when I first met him, I don't even know that he can spell his name, and there's only two letters in it. But I'm tell you something. He has got some fantastic stories to tell, and he's compiled those in this book, which is pretty much his life's work of building lakes and ponds. We've also got another one called Perfect Pond. Want one? That's a great book as well. Troy Todd, good to see you. Now, oh, Troy's, a, Troy's ahead of the game. You're learning how to do this. If you will, please... In the comment section, put hashtag Pond Boss Magazine, click like, and share the video. As a matter of fact, if you'll look on the screen, there should be the word invite. So if you'll click invite, that'll, that'll invite your friends. But we also want you to share it because the audience is beginning to build. And I want to do a big shout out to my friend Jimmy Houston. He shared the promo this week, and we've had over 12,000 people take a look at it. So, uh... We're glad that you guys are here. We got a lot of things to talk about. The question's already coming. Timothy Phillips, lots of algae in my pond in the summer. Can too many grass carp be bad? How many should I have for a one acre pond? Well, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and knock that one out since it's fresh up. Grass carp won't eat algae. Now what you gotta do is you gotta finger out, figure out what they will eat. Now they'll eat vascular plants. They'll eat bushy pond weed, coontail, things like that, but they won't eat algae. So in the pond management business, the pond management of what you do, you need to figure out what's the best tool and then use that. The algae typically goes away in the summertime. Now, when it comes to plants, you need to identify the plant. That's job one. You got to really know what you're doing with that. If you know what the plant is, then you can come up with the best solution for it. How many grass carp in a one acre pond? Depends on how bad the vegetation problem is. I don't I tell you what I do. I start off with three or four and no more than that. And then if that's not enough, then you can add another three or four. The thing is, is you don't want to put in more than you need. So, and the way you tell that is what kind of job they're doing. I want to take a couple of minutes. Right now, I, I was watching Keep Austin Fishing's Facebook page this week, and there are some giant bass being caught right now. One fish in particular down in the Texas Hill Country that I saw was about an eight pound female and her fins were red, the anal fin was red and the uh, tail fin was red and she was already spent. So the spawn is on right now. And one of the questions I did a live uh, interview with those guys yesterday, I think, was on their weekly weigh-in show. The question was asked of me, is it bad to catch bass off of a bed? Well, in a public lake, I don't, I don't think it bothers anything at all. You know, if you think about it, one female bass that weighs eight or nine pounds may lay 100,000 eggs. So how many bass really need to have eggs that can hatch to replenish the population? So I, I think it's more of an ethical question than it is a biological question. Now, when we start talking about, oh, there's Leanne. Leanne Skipworth is on board. Dick Tabbert, Scott Lindsay's on. Dick says, is there a non-invasive pond plant that won't take over your pond up north here? Uh, yeah, there are. There are. There's a number of pond weeds. You know, I think curly leaf pond weeds are a pretty good one. Some native milfoils. Now, what you want to do is you want to avoid the exotic plants. You don't want, um, like, um, some of the sago pond weeds, some of the curly leaf maybe in shallow water. Eurasian water milfoil. That's a tough one. That stuff will take over a pond. So, do a little research and understand what's native to your part of the planet. The, um, oh, you know, one other thing I was going to tell you. For those of you that subscribe to the magazine within the next 24 hours that haven't done it, we're going to pitch in a big poster. That's a sunfish poster. It's very cool. It's a, I think we sell them for $7. So, for a subscription, we'll... we'll We'll, sh we'll throw a, a poster your way. So be sure and subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. Now, how do you do that? You can send us an email at info at pondboss.com. You can uh, go on pondboss.com and click on subscribe now. That's probably the easiest way to do it. And so, shoot, that's uh, we'd love to have you on board. Mike Rivers is on board over there from Tennessee, I believe. Victor Moberg, good to see you. The, um, you know what, I... The, one of the key topics I want to talk about tonight is the diversity of habitat. Since this is the spawning season, we want to be sure we've got lots and lots of gravel beds and places that your bluegill can spawn, places that your bass can spawn. Now, once those little bitty eggs are hatched, they turn into fry. 
very small, not much bigger than that. And their mouth might be as big around as the head of a pin. So not only do they need food when they first come off the nest, they need a place they can hide and not get eaten. So some good dense habitat around the shoreline, that's a wise thing. Um, and then as the fish get a little bit bigger, you want something less dense. Big fish, like big bass, they prefer shallow water, quick access to deep water beside a tree trunk or something like that. So we'll talk more about habitat as we go on. Let's see, there's Josh Flowers with Twin Oaks Pond Management. Josh, glad you're on board, buddy. So now, you know what, let's kind of shift gears and I've invited Debbie to talk about some of the things she sees. When we, we I, I know when we built that pond beside the house back in 2003, I think it was, mm -hmm. you know, just looking at her, she knew. And for those of you that don't, don't know, our home burned down in 2005. That's the bad news. The good news is she got to build her dream home. And she has done some spectacular things. And her eyes, I mean, she sees she sees color. She sees the way things are decorated, the way things work together in a home. And she's carried that out into the pond environment. So um, I've monopolized this conversation for 11 minutes. So let's bring Debbie into this mix, honey. Thank you. I can do that. So when you, like, just take our pond, for example. We've had a couple of weddings. Well, one thing that I remember from the very beginning was this, that if Bob said, we're going to, well, he agreed on the swimming pond. But whether you're going to swim in the pond or just have recreation around the pond, you need to think about it. And I remember when he was having Mike build it, he said, you want to think about your shoreline where you're going to go out four feet, down, out six feet, down, out nine feet, down. And then by 12 feet, that was right at the very edge of the dock. And you're always going to have kids or big kids dive off the dock. And then he made the very middle of the pond 23 feet. So I do remember that in the very beginning for safety and whether you're going to swim in it or whether you're just going to have people fishing around it. I thought that was a very good point. Uh, but one thing that I love about the pond is a pond is has, there's so many things that we look at when we go out there and I want to decorate it. So, you know, I, I have hanging metal, uh, planners that I attach to the dock. Well, come springtime, I will line those and put beautiful sweet potato vines. And what they do is those roots will grow down and the little fish that are around, or big fish that are around the dock, they like to come underneath the, the, the uh, <clears throat> root system that's growing underneath that. On the, and then that's the biolog biological you know, part of me coming out, but the main reason I do it is because I love to see the green that flows out of it all the way around the pond. And what's pretty, Dock. and what's pretty cool about that? There's Stephen Barden with Texas Pro Lake Management. Ethan Lovelace, fisheries biologist from the state of Oklahoma. Look at there. There's Lisa Cronin. Holy cow, Lisa! Good to see you. The uh, the cool thing about what Debbie's talking about is you can buy these almost like porch hangers for flower pots. They're made out of uh, iron, metal. metal. And so we just screwed them to the side of the dock. The water comes up in them. She lines it with coconut, you know, like you'd see in a hanging basket. And then we go to the nursery and we buy um, sweet potato vines. Mm -hmm. And we leave the sweet potato vine roots in the dirt and just sit them down in there and shoot within six or eight weeks. They're wandering out in the pond and you see them floating up on top of the water. It's pretty darn cool and adds, adds color. It adds something that other people don't have. You know, it's pretty dead gum. <clears throat> Linda Jennings is on board. Linda, good to see you. Glad to see the ladies coming on. Honey, what the... So besides the, the plants on the dock and... Well, one thing that I've thoroughly enjoyed has been our floating islands. And we have used the floating islands for several things again. I love to decorate with them. You know, we had one of our sons got married five years ago and they got married right there on the dock. And I took the floating islands that have irises, sweet potato vines. We even have a little bit of a 
uh, some trees. Willow the, trees. Willow right. trees. They just sprouted. And so I took the uh, floating islands, tied them up on the dock, and then decorated them with the twinkle lights. So they were right there on the dock again for decorations and set a, a nice mood for an evening wedding. Uh, something that I like as well, which reminds me, is lighting the perimeter of your pond. Um, on one area, we have a flagstone uh, walkway that walks around the area of the pond to get to the zip line that I've created for the kids and adults to go. We've had a lot of adults. It's not just for kids to climb up and it goes to the middle of the pond and they can drop off. But as they walk around the flagstone patio, I have a rope lighting that will light that area. Not only does it, um, you know, give a nice border to the flagstone, but it lights up at night and it, again, aesthetics is just, you know, it's just beautiful to watch. Yeah, the zip line, the zip line is a huge hit with kids now. Who was the first one to go up the zip line? Well, it was me. <laughs> we don't need to talk about that. Uh, hey, there's Kelly Duffy. Hey, Kelly, glad you're on board. You know, the one of the things I love about what Debbie does is not only does she have a great eye for color, she's also got a great eye for lighting. On the far side of our pond, we've left it pretty well natural. Actually, all natural. But what we did do was we added some landscape lighting <coughs> in the trees to where they shine up on the trees and they shine down on the trees. Let's see, Jacob West, here's a question, honey. Would you recommend a floating island over a permanent island built into a new pond build? Um, I'm going to tell you this, Jacob. I think there's there are two separate things. You know, when what you want in your lake, because I know about your lake, you'd like to have a permanent island because that adds a lot more diversity for your fish habitat, which keeps us on that on that subject for tonight. So when you've got an island out in the middle, I think an island is a good idea. I think an island is a good idea if you need to dispose of some dirt. So when you do that, build the island. Now, one thing Debbie referred to earlier is right along the edge of our pond. It's right by the edge. We have a retaining wall by the house. Then it goes down to four feet deep, and then it moves out about one bulldozer blade wide, as Otto would say, then there's a three to one slope that goes down and then it goes to another flat that's about six feet deep. Then it goes out to the dock and drops off 12 feet deep so people can jump off the dock. So having those, uh, those ridges or those stair steps going down, that's a safe thing to have. Plus, do that on your island, Jacob, because that creates habitat. Then you can decorate it with, with cedar trees or you know, some of the things you got, you guys have some rocks out there. You know, some rock piles on those shelves are good. Kelly Duffy, where he said, hi to you. Good to see you, buddy. My sister, Leanne Loves Poke is on. Tammy Lively Furman. Hey, Tammy, good to see you. She'd love to see a picture of our pond. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll shoot some pictures, out, or I've got some pictures. I'll post them on this Facebook feed. Now, I probably won't do it tonight, but I'll do it tomorrow, and we'll do that. You know, when it comes to the lighting, there's a number of things that you've done. We've got a Bojo Fish Light but you haven't seen those before. Those are, um, they got a little hoardly gig, weed eater looking gadget underneath, a fluorescent bulb, one of those mm -hmm. never die bulbs. Mm -hmm. And what looks like a mixing bowl, a silver stainless steel mixing bowl. And so it comes on at dusk, and when it kicks on, it starts spinning around and around, and it knocks bugs in the water. So you can go out there in the evenings, especially in the summer and the spring and the fall, and you can see all kinds of little sunfish coming up there, turtles coming up there. It's pretty cool just to sit up on the porch. You know, talk about your porch. That's pretty cool. Well, one thing that the porch is uh, <coughs> quite a bit up above the, the pond. So, you know, we can come out there and we have stairs that go down to the dock. And then we have another stairs that goes down on the other side of the pond area. But right in the middle, and I think this has been something that I've enjoyed as well, is that we did a waterfall. So we could take the, we did some rocks 
around and I planted some plants and you know we always put you know I try to put some real pretty ground cover but what Bob has done is taken the put a pump in the waterfall and it takes and just circulates it out of the pond back up through and we have something that's running and I love the sound of just a moving water and of course the grandkids love to sit there and put their feet in it and uh, again, it's just another one of those things that we enjoy sitting there and listening to. And, um, you know, I like to plant the plants around it and see the different things that will come up and get in on it. And uh, the, uh, the other thing that I really do like about having the pond and having, you know, people come over is that, you know, we can sit out there and one thing that I don't know if Bob's talked about, but we started getting the dragonflies. So you don't watch my videos? Stop it. <laughs> I haven't talked about dragonflies. Well, <laughs> and, and I love them. And I think that, that it's something that we're, you know, people go, well, because of the mosquitoes and all of this stuff, uh, that... Um, you know, he's talked to me about having different things. So I plant different plants down even th with pots all the way down to the pond on the rocks for certain things like mosquitoes and things that will will draw the dragonflies, the different flowers and things like that. So basically what we did was we created habitat for dragonfly larvae since they grow up in the water. And the reason we did that is guess what they eat? They eat mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So we've got some pretty cool dragonflies that just that, that hatch all summer long. Now we don't have millions of them because we have fish that eat the larvae as well. But we've got probably five or six different varieties of dragonflies that are pretty cool. Let's see, Scotland, there's Greg Grimes. Hey Greg, I hear you guys had quite the adventure. I bet you're about ready to be home, which I bet you are by now. Scott Lindsay, did you build your dock before you filled the pond? Any way to build a dock yourself after the pond is filled? I didn't think ahead enough to build the dock before the mm -hmm. pond filled. Uh, yes, yeah, we did build ours before the pond filled, mm -hmm. but but there's some really good products out there. As a matter of fact, there's a story in, I think, the November, December issue of Pond Boss about docks. If you'll send me an email and remind me about our conversation, I'll send you a copy of that story, and you can see there's floating docks, there's permanent docks that you can put up with water in the pond. So you can't, yes, you can tackle that. As a, uh, as a reminder to everybody, please hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments, click like, and share the video. Now, if you do that, you'll be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss cup, mug, and a Pond Boss hat. Now, tell you what, this week we'll pitch in one of those posters I showed you all ago. So do that to help us grow the audience a little bit. And then uh, last week's winner was Eric Farr. Now, Eric, you're not a subscriber, so I don't have your address. So uh, I'm going to announce to you here, if you would, send me your address or send it to info at pondboss.com so we can mail your hat and your cup to you. Jim Fritch, finally found the Aquamax Sportfish MVP. Great stuff. Thanks for the tip in the magazine. Love this episode. Hey, <laughs> what's not to love about this episode? Um, thank you for those words. Let's see here. Anthony Abate is checking it in again. Don, a winner out. Ponda got it. Good. There's Josh. Josh is in on that in on that drawing. Um, so, honey, now we've talked about floating islands. Let's see. Jacob asked about a permanent. Let's talk about the floating islands a little bit. We work with Bruce, Kanye, and Kanye with Floating Islands International. We've been up there. I don't know. I've been up there probably three or four times and and we went up there, you've been up there with me once. Yes. We, we went pheasant hunting. We bought a pheasant hunting trip at a Pond Boss Conference auction. Mm -hmm. You know, so we went up there and uh, got to hang out with them. They're at, near uh, um, Yellowstone. Yeah, that? they're on the, right on the Yellowstone River near Billings, Montana. And Bruce is an amazing inventor. He's invented some things you'd never dream of. The floating islands basically are about a, six inch thick matrix of plastic where they float in the water and you put a special kind of sterile topsoil, sterile meaning no seeds. It's not sterile from the sense that it won't grow anything, it will. But, uh, and you plant some plants in it and then the roots go down through the island and absorb nutrients from the water 
But above the water line where the island is, you can tether it. Uh, we tether ours on a rope and it just kind of moves around the pond quite a bit. And then when it gets windy, it'll pull the tether loose. But it's grown some gorgeous plants and it gives some vertical decoration to the pond. You know, another one, we uh, the, not the swimming pond, but a, the pond above that, um, I remember, I don't know how long ago it was, six or seven or eight or 10 years ago, where Debbie loves color, you know, and you, you, look, look at the scene behind me. She did that. And I was up at a fish farm where they raised Japanese koi. So what better to get her for her birthday than some Japanese koi? So I bought some little koi about this big, grew them up in one of our hatchery ponds. We have a couple of hatchery ponds, they're about that big. And then we put them in the, to the pond above the swimming pond. And she can see those in the mornings when she's having coffee. And now they're, I bet you some of those are 25 pounds and 30 plus inches long. A couple of them have great big fan tails, you know, about so big. And uh, she just loves the color of the fish. Now, I had, as a fisheries biologist, I had a little bit of heartburn with biology, but we make sure there's enough bass in there that, and enough bluegill in there that they don't um, conflict. So, you can do that if you want. Let's see, um, who else we got on here? Okay. Dion Myers, Chris Blood from Texas, Hunter, our buddy from San Antonio, Terry Guillory. You gonna chime in, you got something? Well, I was gonna say about back to the koi, um, another thing that I like about them is because like right now with it being cold, I can't, I don't see them, but they'll start showing up and it always, it's kind of like seeing spring flowers or, you know, your daffodils will start popping up. Well, the koi start popping up and I always say, you can tell when the water in the pond is getting a little bit water, I mean warmer and they're coming to the, to the, uh, to the top. Um, I'll never forget that day. I was looking out the kitchen uh, door and I looked out to the pond and I could see a group of the koi just going around the pond with their fins, just fanning. Literally, they were going all the way around the pond. And I, I wonder what they were doing. Well, I mean, I didn't know. I just <laughs> thought they were being pretty for me. Oh, they really were. They were really <laughs> and so I called him and I asked him, I said, oh my gosh. I mean, it's like they're turning somersaults all the way around their pond. I do enjoy them. They're beautiful. And then he told me what they do, were doing, and I liked them even better after that. <laughs> <laughs> they were spawning. You know, speaking of spawning and habitat, this is, this is the time of year that nature wakes up. You know, our days are getting longer. A daylight savings time kicks in for most of the United States this weekend. Spring up, fall back. So we're going to lose an hour, so go to bed an hour earlier, right? But... The point is, trees are beginning to bud. Uh, the fish are shallow. And in the latitude that's probably, say, Waco, Texas, through, um, oh, north, or say, Alexandria, Louisiana, curving back up through Mississippi, Alabama, headed toward the Carolinas, fish are getting ready to spawn. And in that area, they are spawning. Bass are spawning right now. Now, the, the, the thing to keep in mind is, is, you know, part of the topic today is habitat. Habitat's really, really important because, you know, everybody that's a bass fisherman knows what they need to have to be able to catch a bass. But what everybody doesn't think about all the time is how do you get a fish from where it starts as an egg up to that bass that you're going to catch? So as you're thinking about habitat improvements, look at your pond or lakes fishery as um, a community. You know, you have to have places they can eat, places they can go to church, congregate, places where they can reproduce. You know, they got to have places where they can loaf. Uh, Largemouth bass like to ambush. So replicating that is real important when it comes to managing your fishery. I thought of something else that what I you wanted got? to tell him. You know, something else that we thoroughly enjoy and it's that time is getting your wood duck boxes ready. That's a good idea. I love seeing my wood ducks, uh, you know, starting to go to their nest. I heard and, three of them today at the yeah, house. Yeah, so that's just something else that spring break uh, brings is, you know, you get the boxes all cleaned out and get new stuff in there for them and, yes. and get to start watching for them. Yeah, there's so. a pretty good story in the January-February issue of Pond Boss about wood ducks and wood duck boxes, wood duck houses. 
Here's a question. Terry Guillory says, you mentioned something last week about using or not using pond dye. We have a small one-third acre pond in central Louisiana that is spring-fed. Should we use dye? Here's how you make that choice. If your fishery is important to you this time of year, don't use dye. Now, I'm going to kind of crawfish on that a little bit. Forgive the Louisiana pun. But I'm going to crawfish on that a little bit. As long as the dye is diluted, by the time that your fish are finishing spawning, then you can do it if you have a fishery. Now, the reason is, is pond dye stops, it blocks the UV rays from the sun from penetrating in the water, so it prevents plant growth. So your catch-22 is you're going to have some plants, maybe you will, maybe you won't, you know. So uh, if, you, if you put some pond dye in, then you're going to be more likely to not have aquatic plants, but you're also gonna block sunlight away from the water column itself. So the problem with that is you're not gonna grow plankton. So if plankton's an important thing to you, then you should not use, or if you want plankton, don't use pond dye. But if your fishery's not important, use pond dye. Let's see, Lydia Jacobs North checking in from Burleson. Glad to see you, Lydia. Glad you're here. Be sure and rewind this later and listen to what Debbie's saying about the ponds and things. Honey, let's go back to a few of the things. Let's just kind of go around the different ponds. Uh, oh, one of, my, one of my favorite birthday gifts ever from this lady that I love was a redbud tree. Oh, yeah. And we planted that redbud tree across the pond so we, could, so we could see it. So in the springtime, when it comes out, it's the first thing and it just pops. You know, and, and it, I, it just, I, I feel really good when I go outside with her to have a cup of coffee. Even though I don't drink coffee, she does. You know, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, after our home burned, this is a pretty cool story. Debbie worked hard to get her home rebuilt. And her goal was for us to be in there by Christmas so we could celebrate Christmas. Well, that didn't quite happen. So what was the idea you came up with and what did we do there? Well, we just went and got a real Christmas tree. And we made a special spot across from the house or, or the pond. And we had invited the kids and some of the grandkids that were here by then. And we planted a Christmas tree. And now it's doubled in size. No, more than that. You think? Oh, yeah. And so now, and of course, when, we did, when I did the lights, I put a little light underneath him. So it shines up on that Christmas tree. And we, mm. it's a very special place. Yeah, yeah. We go over there and we did... We did a hot dogs and, and everything. So it was just another special place. That, yeah, that uh, Christmas. That was Christmas of 2006. Holy cow, that's yeah. 12 years ago, almost yeah. 11 and a half years ago. When we, we bought a spruce tree, which they don't grow here, <laughs> but that one does, where we planted it. You know, it gets enough shade, doesn't get too hot, has plenty of water. And that thing started off, I think, what, about five feet tall when we planted it? Probably so. It's 15 feet tall now. Yeah. And it's not filled out real good, but the bottom line is we look across and see that, yeah. and it brings back some pretty special memories. It, I remember, too, the year that we put, we decorated it all with just a bunch of fishing lures and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. just We went, we went and bought a bunch of uh, red and white plastic bobbers and stuck them on it. Had some, some uh, lures that we were able to get pretty inexpensively, and we decorated that tree all with fishing tackle. It was pretty fun. Let's see, there's Jeff Gaxiola. He says, uh, what's up, Pond Boss? Best info on the internet. <laughs> That's a pretty big statement, buddy. Thank you. Dion Myers, I have two wood duck boxes on my one and a half acre pond. They moved out a couple of years ago. How do I get them back? If you haven't cleaned out the wood shavings or the nesting materials, clean that out. And then refill it with fresh pine shavings. If you'll do that, do it right now. You stand a better chance. Another thing is a predator guard. If... Uh, if you want, I can send you a copy of the January, February issue of the magazine. It's got a really good story about uh, wood ducks and what to do. But basically, if you clean the box out, make sure it's mm -hmm. fresh. And if you have a predator guard around the pole that you have it attached to to keep varmints from coming up there and getting them, you're going to be more likely to get wood ducks again. Anthony Abate, all the way from Chicago, Illinois, says, How do you convince your significant other to build a couple-acre pond? I'd like to hear an explanation from each of you, please. <laughs> Honey, I want to build a pond. I'm going to spend $40,000 on it. Can I do that? Sure, honey. Oh, there you go. No, really. <laughs> I mean, what, what is it? What is it about what he's asking is what are some of the upsides and things that are important well, to you about a pond? Well, 
it, it, I never have even thought about it as being a something to fish in. I use it as a, we have raised our children, we've raised our grandchildren with birthday parties, and we've had parties, and you know, it is just a very, uh, it's a place to gather during the summertime. You know, I have, I have a dear friend that uh, her mom is, uh, I'm not going to talk about age. <laughs> I just about did. But they come out and they float the pond, I mean, in the summertime. And, you know, we'll get a, a beverage that we enjoy and put our life jackets on and go out there. The kids, they get on the canoe and float it. I even buy a trampoline to put out there for the kids. So it's just an extended area of our home that we entertain in. Uh, Bob and I love to get out there at, after five o'clock in the afternoon with our life jackets on. and July when it's 100 and something degrees. Sun's going down. Anthony, you have this thing called winter. Yeah. We have this thing called summer. Yeah, so it, the pond has just always been more of a an extended area in our home to live, living space, and to make memories with friends and family. Yeah, it's 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 added living space. Now I'm going to tell you my my side of this, Anthony. If I was going to try to convince my significant other, first thing I'm going to make sure she understands is it increases the value of your property. Yes. When you have water that's beautiful, I mean, we're all attracted to water. You know, if just look at a map and see how many of the United States have water as a border. A lot of them. You know, I mean, even even Pennsylvania kind of tips up in there and hits, hits the lake. You know, hits Lake Erie. So, you know, water's a big deal and it adds value. The other thing is, is there's all kinds of amenities. Um, I've, I've helped design boathouses with a sun deck on top where people can get up there, where girls can get up there and sunbathe. You know, like Debbie said, we love to swim in our pond. Uh, a hiking trail. A, build her a place where she can go read a book. You know, wh whatever it is she likes, provide that. And the water adds to the ambiance. Mm -hmm. Now, never mind that you're fly fishing with a five weight trying to catch a two and a half pound bluegill. If she's got the latest book that she loves to read and she's out there watching you or hearing you or just being with you, that's a pretty big deal. So there's a couple of selling points. Let's see here. Don went around. What would be some beneficial plants to put in a new pond with smallmouth, yellow perch, red ear, and hybrid striped bass? Where, where could you find these? Okay, I'll tell you what I would do there is, here's what I tell people about plants. If you've got fairly shallow water and there's a little bit of food in the soil, when the temperature is right, plants are going to grow. So I would wait, my, my advice is to wait and let nature do what nature does and see what happens then. And if it's plants you don't like, then eradicate them and go get some you do because now you've proven that they'll grow. Now, if you want to plant some plants, of course, my favorite is American pondweed. I love eelgrass as well. So um, where could you find them? You know, there are nurseries online that you can buy mm -hmm. from, but... What I do is if there's some native plants growing nearby, uh, it's not a bad idea to transplant some of those and just see what will grow. That way you don't invest a whole lot just to see what's going to happen. Chris Blood, Texas Hunter Feeders. You know, if, if you want to feed fish, he's asking, what what do you guys, rep, rec, what do y'all recommend for feeding koi? Well, you know, Chris, since, since we're feeding koi in, in with our sport fish, we feed Purina's Aqua Max feeds. Now, in that pond, we've also got feed train largemouth bass. We've got bluegill. We've got a few hybrid striped bass. And we've got three dozen of the biggest, prettiest koi you've ever seen. They will eat that Aqua Max 600, but I'll also mix it up with some of the, some of the pond chows that they have that are grain-based feed. So we'll mix up, you know, half a bag of uh, the high-protein, more expensive feed with half a bag of the other feed that doesn't cost as much, <coughs> the grain-based feed. So, now, if you just want to feed koi, you need to get a good koi feed because it has vitamin packages in it 
that the, that the commercial fish foods don't have. And the significance of that is to bring the color of the koi out. You know, with where we have them in a natural pond, they have natural food. So I'm not too worried about those. Let's see here. Let's see. Don went around. What would you suggest for a beach area? Well, I'll tell you what we did. We created a, um, a retaining wall out in, in the pond down about four feet deep. And I brought it up about uh, two feet off the bottom. And then we backfilled that with, with beach sand. We just bought a load of sand like, like the cement guys used to make concrete. Then up on the shore, we laid down a really good thick piece of shade cloth because the hardest thing about a beach is to keep grass from growing in it. So we put shade cloth down and then put about eight or 10 inches of uh, uh, sand on top of that. Then it's a good idea to go in and rake it from time to time to fluff it up so it doesn't compact too much. I think that's a good way to do it. When you say suggest for a beach area, you know, especially in the Midwest, people love to swim in their ponds. And you got about two and a half, three months when the water's really warm enough to do that. And beaches are pretty popular. Let's see here. Uh, Daniel Powell, you're a very blessed man, Mr. Lust. Great to have a wife who is interested in your work, hobby, love. <laughs> Kiss me. No. So, yeah, I'm a pretty lucky guy. Chris Blood, another thing, another big thing building a pond does is add a lot of value to your property. Well worth the investment. That's absolutely right. Uh, I, have seen, I have seen some ponds increase the value of the property more than three times the cost of building the pond. So, now, you know, there's some things <clears throat> about value added that are regional. You know, if you're in an area where there's thousands of ponds, it may not add as much value, but it will add value, especially if, it, if it's the proximity to the, where you're, you know, to your focal point where you can see it as a focal point. That's a pretty good thing. Anthony, let's see, here we go. Brian Lawrence, how do wood ducks do with all the swimming activity? You know, they're usually gone by the time we start swimming. They come in in January and we, I can hear them in the woods. You know, and right now, here we are in March. We're not going to be swimming in March. That water temperature is still in the 50s here, headed up to the 60s, and wood ducks are now nesting. Now, they haven't started to sit yet here where we are. Now, I talked to a, a, one of our buddies over in East Texas. He's got some hens sitting on nests there. But they're typically, they typically raise their three broods if they raise that many, and they're gone by the time it's warm enough to go swimming. So it's not, a, not, not, not really a conflict. And plus, we've got eight ponds on 12 acres, so we've got wood duck boxes spread out everywhere. You know, and there's, there's only one pond we swim in, the swimming pond. Yes. All right. Okay, Anthony Abate, thank God she loves musky fishing. Yep, 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 that's good. There's some value added right there. You can have tiger muskies in your pond if that's attractive to her. Kelly Duffy says, a quote from T. Boone Pickens, water is the next oil. I, you know what? If I don't know if you've thought about it, but if you go buy one of these at ninety nine cents, that's eight dollars a gallon, and we can reuse this if we take care of it. You know, gas, oil, you consume it, it's gone. Let's see here. We got uh, Anthony Abate again. Anthony, you're in there with us, buddy. Blackwater Creek Gold and Food for Koi. There you go. Okay, there's a recommendation for Koi food. I've done a lot of Koi food research for my 2,000-gallon pond. Best quality. There you go. Anybody that's interested in feeding Koi for Koi, there you go. Reagan Green. Hey, boss, our bass are bedding down right now to spawn. Do the bass bite best after the hatch, and how long does it take for the eggs to hatch? All right, I'll tell you this. this great question. There's a lot of... Uh, of um, unknowns in the general public about bedding bass. Because now let me take you through it. Here's how it goes. The male makes the nest. And he'll come in and sweep out a crater, you know, maybe 24 inches in diameter, in water anywhere. It might be 18 inches deep. The deepest one I've ever seen is 12 feet deep in crystal clear water. Most of the time they're in water four to five feet deep, six feet deep, something like that. And after they sweep it out, when a female is ripe and ready to spawn, she comes to the perimeter of where that nest is. He'll go get her and bump her, start just bumping her, bump, 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 bump. And he guides her into that nest, and then he'll bump her from the side, and then she'll lay the eggs, and when she, as she lay the eggs, well, he'll squirt his milt out. 
and then it mingles with the eggs as the eggs sink to the bottom of the nest. And he'll bump her until she's through laying eggs, and that might be 20 minutes, it might be three hours. She might go off to the perimeter a little bit and then come back. So she'll spawn. Now, here's, here's one of the really cool things about spawning bass is a big female bass won't lay all of her eggs at once. She'll lay the ones that are mature, which are the ones typically on the outside of her ovaries, little known fact. So as she spawns those eggs, she has some eggs that haven't developed enough yet to where they can be spawned. So she'll go off, and then those eggs will mature. They spawn in cycles of the full moon. So the next cycle of the full moon, she may spawn again. Now something else is that female may lay some of her eggs on this nest, and then when that male loses interest in her because he's up there collecting that wad of eggs and putting them into a bundle so he can guard them, she'll go to another nest and maybe lay eggs over there with that male 35 or 40 feet away. And then the male sits on the bed, and he guards those eggs, and based on the temperature, that's, that'll determine how long it takes for them, for them to hatch. It may be a week. It may be 15 days. But then he will just be vigilant on that nest. He'll run around in circles, or he'll keep, look, keep a lookout. If a turtle comes, he'll run it off. If other fish come, he'll run them off. You know, and then once those eggs hatch, the little fry absorb their yolk that used to be the egg, then they'll start to rise and move together in unison around the pond. And that will happen for about a week. And at that point, they have absorbed their yolk, they're swim up fry, and they have to eat. They have no body fat stored. So if they don't eat, they die. Well, being the predators that they are, they start eating each other. There's some we call jumpers that grow faster than the others. So the question was, will they bite? You know, how long, okay, did the bass bite best after the hatch? No, um, here's the way that works. The male isn't going to bite at all while he's on the nest. Now, what he will do, if you throw a, a lizard up there and hit the bottom of that nest, he's going to pick it up with his mouth and move it away and throw it off the nest. That don't mean he'll eat it because he's not hungry. His mission is to guard those eggs for them to hatch so that he can they can replenish the parents. Now, what will happen with the female is when she spent all the eggs she's going to spend and lay, she's going to go out in the water, and then she's going to feed. So you can catch her. I saw a picture of a bass. I think I mentioned this early in the broadcast. I called the guy that caught her and because her fins were red, which is early in the year to me. Well, he said that he watched her spawn. He could see the eggs coming out, and he waited till she was finished. Then he threw a bait out there and caught her, took a picture, and turned her loose. Now, if you catch a bass off of a bed, a female, she's not going to sit on the bed. The boys sit on the bed. And if you catch a male off of a bed and you release him, he'll go right back to that same bed. So, there's some uh, interesting factoids about bass that not a lot of people know. Let's see here. Uh, Roy Worthy, we planted bald cypress in one of our ponds. The roots and knees make great small fish cover and look great. That's absolutely true. And it's stunning to look at. It's kind of hard to mow around. But it's pretty cool to look at. Victor Moberg, do the wood duck boxes need to be on the water or near it? Uh, yeah, they do. They need to be close. I mean, because what happens is what what'll happen is that wood duck hen will lay an egg every day, and when she gets a clutch, she'll sit, and then they all hatch on the same day, and they're supposed to. And when they hatch, they the she she goes out first, and she starts pushing those. No, I'm sorry. The babies start climbing out, and they jump out. And then she leads them to water. So the shorter the distance to water, the better it's going to be for them. And then she hides them. I mean, when, when we see baby wood ducks, we don't see them for very long at all. Jason Nipstad, somebody is releasing koi in our lake. How big of an issue is it? It's 130 acres. Will they eat the grass also like carp? You know what? They will eat some grass, but they're not going to control it like grass carp. The, uh, the issue at 130 acres is not really not that big a deal. You know, because you've got enough predator fish in there to keep their reproduction in check. Let's see here. There's Mike Garcia, Chico. Man, I was just plugging your uh, live weigh-in show. Glad you're on board, buddy. Thank you. Let's see. Reagan Green, thanks for your really thorough answer. Man, I'm talking fast as I can. <laughs> Kelly Duffy, what are your thoughts concerning the pros and cons of submerged vegetative cover versus artificial cover, especially for establishing and maintaining forage fish populations? Well, here's my opinion about that. I would much rather have vegetative cover 
for newly hatched fish because it supplies a wider variety of the of the grazing foods that newly hatched fish need. But if you're in that kind of a situation where you can't have vegetation, <laughs> artificial cover works really, really well. And the thing about artificial cover, especially like our friends Mossback Fish Attractors, Fish Habitat makes, is it will soon be coated with paraphytin and some algaes and things that fish can come and pluck off of that. Plus the, the limbs on Mossback look like angle iron with the bee pointed up. So as things in the water column die, they have a tendency to collect somewhat in the V trays of that fish cover. So they add some food. But if I had to pick between one or the other, I would rather have small to moderate amounts of aquatic plants that are native to that part of the country. Looky there, there's Mary Blood. Hey, Mary. She says, what's the best way to attract mallards to your lake? Feed them. <laughs> Now, once you attract mallards to your lake by feeding, move the feed away from the watershed because it seems like when a duck eats a pound, it poops two pounds, you know, and that's really hot fertilizer. So if you've got a small pond and you want to have a few mallards, you can go to the feed stores right now. I was in a feed store this week and they're selling baby ducks. So if we wanted baby ducks, now's the time to get them. Let's see, Terry Guillory just signed up for two years for Pond Boss Magazine. Attaboy, Terry, thank you very much. You're helping to fuel the economy that pays this thing. Much obliged. Daniel Powell, okay, I, I see what you're trying to say, but I don't get it. Um, corn. Corn, oh, okay, corn. <laughs> oh, feed corn to wood. Yeah, okay, well, that's a way to feed them. Yeah, corn. Uh, mallards love corn. I thought it said calm. Huh. You know, oh, man. Oh, oh, yeah, corn. Okay, so, um, yeah, feed them. Feed them, Mary. If you can feed them corn, they'll eat fish food. I mean, we've got, when we have mallards moving through and our Texas hunter fish feeder goes off and spits out that feed between the ducks and the turtles and the fish, it don't last long at all. Yeah, Daniel says corn for the mallards. They, they'll, they will eat that. Now, the thing about, you got, you got two choices. You got domesticated mallards and you've got migratory mallards. So if you're in a flyway and they're coming through, you could probably feed some while they're coming through and they love to eat. I'll tell you what they like to eat. They like to eat the tops of American pondweed seed heads. They stick up out of the water about that far. And if you've got some aquatic plants in the pond, mallards are going to come, especially if they're, if they're safe. So there you go. The, uh, let's see here. What else we got? All right. There, there we're caught up on the questions, honey. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about, um, if somebody called you and said, Hey, I loved your, what you said on the show. And would you help us decorate a pond? Uh, I've heard you talk about lighting. I've heard you talk about places to be like the dock, uh, ways to enjoy the pond, like the floating islands and the zip line. And, um, Something that I, you know, that we didn't talk about, I mean, it is, um, a, we, we have, are fortunate that our deck right out of the house, but, you know, doing some benches, just a simple wooden bench, like under a tree, you know, and maybe, a, I love, I love old, uh, cedar tree stumps to set beside it. You know, and you can plant a plant. You can put your, you know, whatever you're drinking. But benches are nice. I think we've done that in a couple areas down at the other pond. People like to sit on them and fish. So benches, just a simple, you know, where you cut a tree and then put it on a stump. Just things where people can, when they go down to the pond to look at it, there's places to sit. Yes, yes. So, so as you're as you're thinking about it, you know, it's it's... We all have a tendency to get wrapped up in the biology and the fish and, oh my gosh, we're going to grow some giant bluegill or some hybrid stripers that fight like a freight train. But it is a good idea to think about some of the amenities. So Debbie's highlights are lighting, um, plants, places to sit, ways to enjoy it. We've designed hiking trails. Uh, if you've got a bigger body of water and you want a boathouse, Design the boathouse not only as a place to keep your boat, have a place, make it make it living space. Well, one of the coolest boathouses I've ever seen was in the Texas Hill Country. And you go down and they chiseled out of the rock 
kind of a, it, 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 you, you step down some rock steps and there's a cliff, about a six foot tall cliff that's the back of the boathouse. And then they built the boathouse out and against that cliff is a fireplace. So can you imagine, mm -hmm. you know, on Thanksgiving weekend and you're down on the dock and you've got the green monster fish lights where you can see the fish swimming around the dock. You know, you've got the rope lights and all that good stuff, you know, where you can enjoy it. Look at a boathouse as well as living space. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Josh Flyer's got to go. Great listening to Mr. Bob Lust. Debbie, Riley and I are off to feed. Go ahead, dude, it's going to get dark. Oh, too late, it already is. Anthony, how long will a three to four, how long will a three to four sunken through the ice, six foot Christmas trees, cinder block together, provide cover for fish? I'm trying to figure out the interval that I should add more without adding excess debris to the pond. Two acres, bluegill, crappie, bass, tiger, musky. Here's the answer to your question. Within six years, there's nothing left but the trunk and a handful of the biggest limbs. They're going to be gone. <clears throat> I, I would do it every second year. Go out to the same place and, and enhance those existing piles, Anthony. If you'll do that, then over a period of time, you're going to have consistent fishing right there. And by the way, where you are with ice, uh, I'd be looking at how I'd fish it in the wintertime as well. You know, drop drop those cedar trees in, in the water depth where you know that your sunfish and bass are going to tend to congregate. That way, you can drill a hole and catch them in the wintertime as well. Bear Brundrett, Mike Otto plays Sacrete Steps descending into our pond. Low cost and effective place to sit and put your feet in the water. That's exactly right. And what's really cool about what Otto did with Bear there is when he created those steps, he just put the sacrate down in the bag <laughs> and it rained on it and got hard. So those, you know, there's no fuss, no work. You just had to have somebody strong enough to lift an 80 pound bag of sacrate. And uh, he just carved out the dirt, you know, to make the stair steps going down and put the sacrate in there. And it, it works really, really well. So uh, Chris Blood, some of the other neat pond ideas can be found on some of those Lake Life TV episodes by the Herman Brothers. Yes. Oh my gosh, we love Nate Herman and his family, Nate and Brooke and, you know, his brothers and his sister and his mom and dad. There are some, uh, there are some great ideas. I mean, they, they built their dad, one of the coolest things ever. They built a boathouse that's a man cave that looks like a volcano. <laughs> you see, we got a TV in it. Do you know, I think though, t going back when we were up there is on their dock, they had carved out in the very middle oh, yeah. where we could go down yeah. four or five feet. Yeah. Tell them about that. Oh, that's that, just cool. That was fun. Hey, you want to do something really cool, Anthony? Yes, Here, that was fun. Here's this. What they did there was they built a dock where you could step down in, in a rectangular hole in the middle of the dock to a platform that's about six feet under the water. And then they've got these reels of, of hose with diver's masks where you can put a diver's mask and then a scuba breather. I don't know what you call it. And they've got a little air compressor that they plug in that gives you just enough positive pressure where you can just sit there and reel out all the hose you need and sit down on the bottom. Well, they feed the fish there. So, so that was fun. Yeah, so you, we, they, they would give us a little net bag of fathead minnows and you could go down and sit on a ledge six feet underwater and watch these smallmouth bass, largemouth bass and catfish come up and you pull a little minnow out of a net bag and stick it out there and they'd come pluck it out of your hand. But one thing Bob did want to remind me of is you really do need to have clear water, which we don't have clear water all the time. Well, you know, yeah, so that, that was an issue with me wanting to do it because I wanted yeah, to do it. Yeah, and you know, clear water is rare. And, but Especially they, six feet all the way. You well, know. see, but see, they had a, they had a reclaimed mine so the water's pretty, it was pretty sterile. They've sold that place. But it was cool. It yeah. was fun. It yeah, was and, fun. and another thing that's kind of cool that you can do is is like what Bruce Candelo, and I'll have Bruce on as a guest before long. He, in his dock, he loved what the Herman Brothers did with theirs, so he had them build him a dock in Lincoln, Nebraska. The Herman Brothers are in Peoria, Illinois. But uh, what, uh, and Anthony, you need to go see the Herman Brothers. Go see um, Giant Goose Ranch. You guys look up Giant Goose Ranch and you'll see what we're talking about with what they've done. <clears throat> but what Bruce did was he, he left some holes in the dock so he could have cages. So he makes a PVC frame and then he uses this plastic netting 
that he surrounds the cage of this this frame with, shaped like a loaf of bread, and he'll put fish in it. And so he'll grow some fish in these cages and then get them on feed, you know, and then stock them into his 10-acre lake later on. So, uh, yeah, Anthony, that is a pretty cool, pretty cool idea. If you get a chance, get in touch with the Herman brothers. Tell them the Palm Boss said hello. So, uh, holy cow, it's coming up on 729, honey. you have any closing thoughts? No, this was really fun. Will yeah. you have me back? Oh, uh, yeah. Heck, yeah, yeah. Why not have you back? I've What's always... not to have back? <laughs> hey, listen, thanks for joining us tonight. Don't forget, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like, share the video. If you haven't subscribed to Pond Boss Magazine, please do. So uh, thanks again for joining us. This is really a blast. We'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday night.